Hello and welcome to the In The Money Players podcast. This is our show for Friday, February 24th, covering races from the 25th. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, back with you in the Brooklyn Bunker once again, which you can see if you're watching along on YouTube, one of the many places you can get the show, along with really wherever you get your podcasts. We encourage you to follow us where you can, rate, review, subscribe, tell people about the show, all those fun things to help us along here on uh, the In The Money Media Network so we can keep bringing you all this great content and one provider of all manner of content for us on the network, whether it's uh, on the plus side for big events or covering the Naira races for free over at InTheMoneyPodcast.com as well as a frequent co-host on these airwaves. Uh, we're going to bring him in now. He is Nick Tamaro. Nick, what's going on? I'm doing great, my friend. And I found myself on the plus side the majority of my life. So uh, plus size, <laughs> side, I should say. But uh, no, it's good to be with you. Relatively light weekend, you know, in comparison to what we've run into recently and what we're going to have moving forward for the next couple. But uh, we'll take it. We'll have still some opportunities out there that hopefully we can find some winners. A few bits of news will drop in straight away. We do have, speaking of plus, a show with Michael Adolfson running us down the card. He had some really Good ideas and interesting angles with his, you know, international perspective on some horses who are going to be really laid out for this meet, others who might be uh, prepping, etc. Check that out in the moneypodcast.com slash plus. Uh, folks probably know this already. No Santa Anita this weekend, so no coast to coast shows. But instead, what I'm going to do is we'll have a seg. If you're listening to this podcast, the next segment will be me and Matt Dinnerman talking about the Saturday golden gate late double. And I'll probably put up a little mini show for Sunday covering the same the late double at golden gate. Cause we, you know, we got a lot of action uh, junkies out there and golden gate going to be the only game in town. And we like to support them as a larger uh, part of the, the, the extended in the money family through our relationship with first racing. So we'll have that content up there instead. And then next week, we don't know exactly when it's going to be yet. It's going to depend on how the races draw, but we're going to be doing a live stream next Saturday. Lots of info about that. Nick, if you're not busy next Saturday afternoon, I'll probably try to pull you in for at least part of it. My hope is that it's one of these days where the coast to coast all takes place in 60 minutes or so. And we get the two big triple crown prep races in there and we can, cover that whole thing but we'll see if one race is if it, if the pick five is all spread out if those three-year-old races aren't near each other we might have to come up with plan b but we're going to be doing something cool so be on the lookout for more information about that so what are we going to do in this first segment well we are in lieu of santa anita we're going to take a look at the late pick five at gulf stream some interesting stuff going on in here but we'll kick it off with a look at the big uh, points race of the weekend the grade two rebel coming to us from oaklawn park and a big full field in this one but and, and tell me I'm being uncreative and I, and I need to uh, do, do something better here, Nick. It, is this, you know, another one of these, oh, I'm so surprised this water is wet situations with uh, Brad Cox holding a very, very strong hand. Is it, is it a Brad Cox match race or is this an open, uh, is this an open affair here at Oakland Park on Saturday? Yeah, I mean, two horses under three to one on the morning line for Brad in the, in the one verifying, <clears throat> excuse me, in the five giant mischief it seems tough to get past them. You know, if you're trying to, you're going to have to be a little bit creative. There's going to be some support for reincarnate. You know, the, the thing about reincarnate is that he was 16 and a half to one when he ran in the sham last time out, it was a stable mate Newgate that was supposed to get the job done that day. He came back and won the Bob Lewis. Um, and it was a, you know, this is another situation that we talked about. We've talked about it a little bit this year. We talked about it last year with regards to horses moving out of the care of Bob Baffert's barn and into to that of other trainers, including Tim Yachtin. So, you know, what you're going to get from him is unknown. The other problem that he runs into is that this looks like an awfully fast paced race on paper. I mean, there's, exactly. there are a number of runners in here that want to be forward and, you know, maybe, maybe I'm just totally wrong on this but boy it feels like the only reason powerful is in here is to make sure that that things heat up quite a bit and i would imagine if he doesn't go to the lead his job is to keep verifying lock to the rail so oh you know that's going to help both the asmas and horses that happen to run uh, break out of posts directly next to him so i i guess if we want to start our conversation with verifying you know, you and I talked about this horse after his allowance win last time out. He obviously beat Gun Pilot, who came back three weeks later and won a one other then, uh, or two life, I should say, pretty impressively. The issue that we had at the time with verifying is that that big effort came with Lasix. And he was a horse that was good without Lasix, but he looked very good with it. What are we going to get? You know, this is we've seen these situations play out recently. Um, Litigate was a horse that I liked a few weeks ago at Tampa who had run 
without Lasix in his debut with Lasix in his second start, improved in his second start, but he can't ended up being able to run fine without it. That's the concern. The giant mischief issue to me is that this horse has run well um, now all three times, but the horses he's run against have just drastically underperformed in their subsequent starts. So you're, you're almost wondering if it might be a little bit of fool's gold on giant mischief. I'm hoping that the, I mean, I absolutely agree. I mean, you look at the form of those races and it is, it is not pretty. Let me pull it up here. We've got uh, actually the, f- finally from the debut, a couple of runners did come back and win, but the O for 10 out of the, out of the Keeneland race and then O for six out of the Remington race. But He's been good enough on the clock. He, for I think you pointed to the race shape here. He's going to get a great race shape here. He's been working well. He and Verifying have been working well together. I didn't authorize this for on-air use, but I don't think he'd mind. I did go ahead and text Frank McGowey, who's been clocking at fairgrounds, what he thought of the two. And he, he just very succinctly said he thinks that Giant Mischief might be Cox's best. So, I mean, it's apparently training well. So I'm going to... I'm going to begrudgingly look past that excellent form analysis that you're doing, Nick, and go with him in this spot. When you put it all in the hopper, who do you come up with? I mean, and I think another factor that we'd be remiss in not mentioning, there's really not much of a of a handicapping element to this, but Irad is not taking a trip to to Oaklawn for Lucas. Right. I mean, it, it, this is this is because and he has a derby horse already. But, you know, I think they want to know a little bit about where Giant Mischief stands in terms of, of this group. And quite honestly, Brad Cox has so many horses that I mean, he's going to run out of jockeys at some point. Also, I'm going to tentatively pick Gun Pilot. I know Gun Pilot has to run better to beat Verifying. Verifying handled him very nicely. I thought the two life win last time out was good. I know all things considered, he had a pretty good trip, but he rated comfortably. He finished up. He's a horse that's really bred to excel with extra distance on the bottom side. And so I'm going to going to try him for a slight upset. I think if it becomes a fast paced race, it really plays into Ricardo Santana Jr.'s hands to just drag him back and let him make one run. It's worth noting to me that he opts to go here um, in Instead of riding uh, Red Route 1, who he was aboard in the Southwest last time, who I think was bolstered by a wet track, being probably a horse that when push comes to shove is a little bit better on turf. So I'm going to pick Gun Pilot, but I mean, I would never I would never make a multi-race bet here without using Giant Mischief and probably verifying as well. Um, but I could see myself maybe preferring Giant Mischief of those two, because I do have some real concerns about what kind of trip verifying is going to work out from the rail. It doesn't look easy. It doesn't look easy. That's uh, that's for sure for, for verifying in terms of race shape. Let's just, I know this is such a silly game to play because there's all so many different reasons it could go down. And But what do you make of Giroux, who's been working giant mischief in the morning, ending up on... Um, ending up on verifying here is that do you think the call might have been promised to to her ad do we do you have any intel or any guess i'm not worrying about it but it just seems like good podcast fodder so i'm throwing it out there for for a tangent yeah good question i i don't i feel like this you know this is an ownership group on giant mischief that's made up of about 15 20 different you know individual uh ownership entities so maybe this is a dis- decision made by the racing manager there. I, I don't have any insight, uh, but I could kind of see it. I, I know there was some chatter after the springboard mile that, you know, wasn't a lot of love for his ride in that race. So I could see maybe that being a little bit of a punishment. And this might be his stint in the penalty box, because I mean, the bottom line is that if giant mischief wins this race and then, um, and then, then Forte wins the fountain of youth. And obviously if these horses are all running on the same day, Irad is going to ride Forte. So, you know, giant mischief could end up opening right back up. It's an interesting question because, yeah, the, the, I don't know if I blame Giroux for the for what happened in Remington just because the horse didn't break, but I guess he did kind of rush up. I don't know. I, I I have trouble blaming him for that. And then it's weird that he – like you'd think if they were going to bench him, he wouldn't be working the horse. It's it's. I have a feeling we'll get some texts from people associated with that ownership group who might be telling us what the inside story is. It is very, very exceedingly 99% – unlikely to affect my my opinion of the race but that's a there's a high level look at the rebel um let us know here's my question for the i like to put these youtube questions up there and i got to get better about going in there in the comments and answering them i want to hear folks idea of who the best brad cox contender for uh, the the triple crown series is let us know let us know what you think in the comments on youtube and if you're listening and want to participate in the convo hop over to the youtube channel which you should be subscribing to anyway and let us know over there let's pivot down to south florida nick and talk about 
is pick five at Gulfstream on Saturday. It begins with race number eight at 338 Eastern. And we've got an allowance race going seven and a half on the turf to uh, kick things off. How do you want to light this candle? You know, I thought this was a really good and competitive race. And I will admit the last time you ran, I picked Hoku, um, who I, I clearly missed the wedding on in that debut when he won at 18 to one for Kelsey Danner. I wonder if maybe she just threw him into the deep end by sending him a mile and a half. He went to the lead and then ultimately got tired. This feels like a much more realistic distance. Seven and a half might be a little short, but I do think he's going to be better at seven and a half than he would be at a mile and a half. So I'm, I'm going to pick him and, and expect a little bit of an improvement here. Um, now third time out, obviously a horse with some serious ability. I thought the runner immediately to his inside chasing the crown was very dangerous as well. He was involved in a fast pace last time out, reached the front before weakening late. Journeyman came back and won at Gulfstream on, uh, I think, Wednesday. And up to the mark was an impressive off the pace winner in there. So those two kind of felt like the main two. I was a little concerned about Abisco who, you know, has obviously had a lot of problems staying healthy, but all things considered is really supposed to excel on the turf and is showing some quick drills at pace and on the grass. So um, there was a little little thought on my part that maybe this horse might get a little bit better on the turf. I mean, the siblings that have won on the turf include Aurora Way and Polar Light. It's obviously a Chiefs Wood Stable, which is not only a phenomenal set of silks, but a group that's had a lot of good horses over the years. I think those are some good ideas, including the the Bisco uh, 20 to one. I have a, a potential stinger in here as well, but I'll start with the top of the market where I did think chasing the crown looked like the right one to me. Uh, hoping maybe can get held up a little bit more off the pace, given that there's so much speed signed on here. But that was a really nice run on Pegasus Day, I thought, attacking that strong pace, sticking on well. And my goofy idea, and it's goofy, but number five husband material, I thought was worth a little bit of a look zero running obviously off the bench but that was a 500 day layoff back in 28 days showing a notably fast work since on the turf and i just think toner's so underrated this horse could legitimately be 30 to 1 and have a chance to get up there in the vertical so i'll nominate uh, the five as a potential interesting price alternative to chasing the crowd crown going to take another long look at hoku because i think you make some some good points on there i was discounting the the I don't know why I was discounting the maiden win. When you go back and look at that, I mean, that's the angle I usually rave about closing into those blue time form U.S. fractions. So, yeah, I'm going to throw Hoku in as a, as a backup as well on your say so, Nick, as we move to race number nine and some familiar names in this uh, Gulfstream Park sprint stakes. Field of seven going postward. I feel like this sets up beautifully for number seven, uh, uh, candy man rocket this horse has had tons of issues as anybody can see with a glance through the pps but very encouraging to me back now in just 35 days after all those long layoffs uh, visually impressive in the comeback or more important than visually impressive impressive on the clock despite being wrapped up and i feel like this draw gives alvarado options um the pace is hot here but i think candy rocket man has an opportunity to, excuse me candy man rocket has an opportunity to uh, stalk and pounce, if not just seize the bull by the horns in this spot. I was going to try to just get out with him in this spot. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, he made out great at the post position draw. And this is a horse who always hinted at having pretty serious ability. He's just been been dogged by injuries over and over in his career. It's great to see him now running two consecutive races without a layoff. That's not something that he's really been able to do uh, going all the way back to his three-year-old season. The only thing that scared me about the balance of this field was Super Ocho. And he's in such good form right now. I wondered if he might be able to sneak away. Um, I mean, time from us has it a, a moderate pace, not tilted one way or the other. And he has been in pretty darn good form going all the way back really to late last year. I mean, his breeders cup sprint effort was not bad at all. He got involved in a hot pace with Jackie's warrior before understandably tiring. I know it was only five eights last time up and Amiciel Jaramillo is very good on front running types. So I'll probably have a backup ticket with super Ocho on it, but it, like you, I'm kind of expecting Candyman rocket to win this race. I thought of a tangent for us. Um, I want to get back to that idea that I just mentioned about the the visually impressive um, versus w when when visually impressive matters to me and when it doesn't matter to me, or when visually impressive sometimes makes me actively want to bet against said horse. I suppose this is a little bit of a, a callback to the the Hoosier Philly conversation we had on the early week show. 
I don't discount the idea of visually impressive, but I'm extremely skeptical when visually impressive doesn't match the clock. I, just not to pick on any horses, but I think of a, you know, Princess Noor heading into the Breeders' yeah. Cup juvenile fillies a few years ago. But when a horse puts up a good time and looks good doing it, I'm just going to give that a little extra credit. And I will say this, when a horse is going to be a price and has a, if a figure comes back low on the turf, especially, and looks good doing it, I will upgrade those horses, especially because the time is very often going to lead to a good price. And the, the Breeders Cup example I think of from, from recent years with that one is uh, it wasn't shared account. That was the mom sharing was the sure. name of the Philly, you know, had a, had a low figure turf race, but you know, especially when it comes to turf racing, if the, if the pace is slow, very often, you know, you can only make the final figure so fast. And if you can look and find an internal sectional that's fast and they look good doing it, that's when I will call to that, that visual impressive. I think it's, it's sometimes overused, but it's not, not a thing. Wait, wait, chime in on, t tell me if, uh, tell me where you stand on this, this whole notion. Cause I know you've had some good scores betting against ones that were visually oppressive. Does, does that mean you never care? Um, no, I, I think, it, it all has to be taken in context. I mean, Bellamy Road was visually impressive in the Wood Memorial. He was also extremely yeah. fast, right? Um, Julia uh, Hoosier Philly was visually impressive in the Goldenrod and was slow. So, you know, it, it all has to be taken into context. How did the race unfold? You know, what kind of setup did they get? Who were they running against? All of these things. And so when you stack them up, one after another and you you can come to a conclusion of some sort if you're basing your opinion on some type of eye test i think you're probably overvaluing your ability to look at horses just a tad you know it, it, that's a little it, if you're and especially if you're doing that when some of the other um you know uh, objective uh, elements that you can use for analysis point to something different so if you think somebody looks particularly good but you know the speed figures don't hold up then you're probably reaching a tad so i think you want to you want to keep all of those things in context and i mean you know echo again looked very impressive in his debut last summer at saratoga and and i immediately kind of rained on the parade afterwards and said you know i think he beat nothing and i think he, he set a very slow pace and everybody was like you're an idiot you know you don't know what you're doing <laughs> have Everything you ever watched a race yeah. right exactly and he hasn't won a race since then so you know i mean was i right yeah in that sense i was right i i had also seen some of these things happen with steve asmus and horses before so you know you just it, it's part of the error is a is a rush to judgment and and this this overwhelming and insatiable need that people have to label every horse you know this one is the greatest since then and this one is that and that one is this and it's just you know take them for what they are and, and assess what they've done based on what happened it's one data point in a sea of data points and one other interesting example i'll think of it, going back to flight line i felt like earlier in his career he was a horse who was doing these insanely fast things and I'd watch the race and like have some questions about just very subtle things about like how the horse was moving. I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to, you know, stand up to the rigors. I, I questioned it. I remember a listener early on last year saying, Oh, this horse is eight to one for the breeders cup classic. He's a cinch and cynically saying he's eight to one to make it to the race. And then as the summer goes on and you continue to watch him and he just looks better and better every start, all of a sudden that eye test I'm going like, whoa, 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 this horse, look what this horse was doing when there were some questions about him and the way he was, uh, you know, his ability to stay on the track, et cetera. And, and, and now he's moving well, you know, I'm, I'm not meaning to red board a one to nine shot here, but the point is it's like the, the key point to me is it's one data point in a, in a sea of data points and it's worth talking about sometimes, but yeah, when somebody's going to say that's all they need and they, they don't need, if, if, what, what do we need these figures for? You know, good luck. <laughs> No, figs don't lie. No doubt about it. And problem, you know, flight line is always going to be kind of a, a difficult example in this context, because the problem with the way he was campaigned and, and obviously with the issues that he had is that every race took on an incredible amount of importance, you know, and so it was almost as if every one of them, he had no margin for error at all. Now, fortunately, he he never erred. Right. I mean, he just never made a mistake. Never, he was didn't miss a shot. <laughs> yeah, he was always. He ran the table. table. 
Right. And, and I mean, credit to John Sadler for that rather than than scoffing at the, the number of times he ran, you know, really focus on the fact that when he did, he was really, really, really good, you know, historically good. So, um, again, that's an eye test where it doesn't matter how many sets of eyes you're looking at. All those races he ran were damn fast. Right. I mean, they were not phonies by any means. And he kept getting better and better. And I mean, I'll admit, having seen him in the Met Mile, I was completely convinced at that point that that we were looking at something totally different. And, you know, it wasn't exactly a groundbreaking opinion, but yeah. um, he subsequently won his next two starts and, you know, goes uh, goes down as a, a re- an easy first ballot Hall of Famer. Let's get to the hinge of this Gulfstream pick five on Saturday race. Number 10, Phillies and mayors in the allowance ranks going seven and a half on the turf. I'll start with what I think the key question is in this race, Nick. What are we doing with these uh, Chad Brown imports from the provinces of France? You know, and I'll tell you, Pete, I mean, they all look like they have the same stats, right? Chad, off of 365-plus day layoffs, new to America on the turf. That's the category for Spanish Baroque, 25% dollar forty eight ROI. You know, nothing special, probably a little bit better first-time Lasix as well, um, which is the case with her. A, her form from overseas is nothing to be particularly thrilled about. Um, we don't get any workout insight either with her being at Payson. As far as Chili Flag goes, she's been at Payson as well. It, it actually looked to me like they might have been working together. Uh, no, I'm sorry. They did not work together. Um, but, you know, similar situation, right? This is a horse that has maybe been facing slightly better than uh, her stablemate did, is a little bit more active. This is a group that maybe doesn't necessarily – have as many high quality Euro shippers as, uh, as Peter Brandt would. So they're a tough read. You know, I, I could see you wanting to kind of chuck both of them. I could see them running one too. You know, I, I, I hate being so, you know, so that's the range. Yeah, that's I mean, the the range, range Chad Brown first time imports uh, from the provinces of France. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that it's already late February and I'm thinking that with both of them having a pretty open amount of conditions, if these were horses that he really had high aspirations for, we'd be seeing them in Lexington. So I'm thinking that he might be looking to get a race into each one of them. Um, seven and a half is also short for generally for a Chad Brown trainee. His horses are usually, you know, more route oriented. That's why I picked making my move. I'm going to bet making my move in here, stretching out. Um, this is just a send job. This is a horse that's supposed to be on the lead. She's always shown some ability. She's a winner at seven eighths. And if she's able to get that additional half a furlong, which really shouldn't be that tough, having a second turn to work with aggressive jockey on board. I mean, I'm hoping she wires the field. I thought Go-Go Shoes had a little bit of a look too. I don't love that her form looks like it's maybe climaxed a bit, but um, I thought she was a little bit dangerous. And then I picked Chad's horse, the Spanish Baroque third. So, I mean, I would probably use both of them to not be knocked out of the pick five, but boy, I have no read on them. Yeah. You and I are in lockstep in terms of top pick making my move. I think is real interesting stretching out from the five furlongs chance to lead these on a merry chase, looking at pace figures. This is a stakes winner who classes up well with this field. Second time layoff in this spot as well. The only thing I'll say for Chili Flag over Spanish Baroque, other than the obvious about the post, d- did earn the best time form rating going left-handed. And of course, the you know from an ROI point of view, the 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 the, the, the stats might not be gorgeous, but they just they're prolific winners. And and I do think I would probably have the seven and the eleven on the backup line. But I'll bet making my move in this spot if we get anything close to the, the five to one of the morning line. So there, there we are. We're quite similar. Race number 11 is an allowance race on the dirt going one mile for these uh, four year olds and up. And I thought desert ruler was interesting. And the horse that I probably want to bet in here, tough run last time did not break. Well, it was a legitimately poor break made a run on the inside where I didn't think that was any particular advantage. This horse has shown good finish before, and there's plenty of speed in this spot. So that was going to be my top pick. And then I wanted to mention a horse. I'm not sure how well he classes up, but the six bourbon creed was going to be on some tickets. I thought he was the most interesting one out of the common race, simply because that pace held together and he was trying to rally from last and might be flattered by a much, but presumably much faster race shape today. I will probably include judge Davis, the nine as well, beat Bourbon Creed the last day and looks well suited to the mile. Just looking back at uh, some of those earlier PPs. I had it uh, preference for the five, but some sixes and nines as well. Where are you? I agree with you completely on, uh, on the top pick as well. I, I picked desert ruler. I thought he was an excellent fit. And, um, 
is probably going to get the right kind of setup this time around. Agreed totally on everything you said about his last effort. The stumble was bad. He kind of, he sort of ran in spots a little bit because I think Lionel Reyes was kind of throwing him all over the track, but he kept running all the way to the wire. Milliken is a solid horse who ended up in a dead heat with Petulante in there. So no shame in that. Um, you know, one horse that I was a little, there were a couple of horses in here that I really didn't know how to handle. The first of them is Principe Doro, who broke his maiden last out at Aqueduct all the way back in April of last year. And, and you know, for all of the good work Chad or uh, Todd Pletcher had done with horses off of long layoffs, his numbers have kind of, his, this is not really the strength that it used to be for his stable. It's his, his numbers have dropped off a little bit. That's a little disconcerting. I wonder if this horse's maiden win is maybe not quite as good as it looks on paper. And the eight American Prince, I thought was interesting, given that he ran well last time out for 35 behind a horse like Collaborate, you know, who at one point was a graded state caliber runner. I just didn't love. And I wonder if maybe they, they didn't have a lot of options to run him. I hate that he's in for the tag. You know, I know that that's the only way he qualifies for this race, but it just it's it's not the most thrilling thing that they took him for 35 and are willing to lose him right back for 25. Um, given that he's probably a horse they hoped had a little bit of upside. I agreed with you on uh on Bourbon Creed, I thought he was the one I wanted to take a little bit more than Judge Davis, though I do think Judge Davis would be helped by the uh, by the pace scenario. So I'm going to lean on the five a little bit here, but we'll also have, you know, to some extent, some versions of the two, six, eight and nine as backups. OK, I like the sound of that. We'll move on to our pay leg in this pick five and uh, a race that has a big standout. We'll, we'll ask you about three year old Colts going one mile on the turf. I'll just the key question. Are you with Carl Spackler or against? I smoked out Carl Spackler in here. What do you think? <laughs> so you're with. That took a real, real <laughs> bit of keen insight. I felt like I felt like I was rather perspicacious with this uh look at this race. I mean, if this horse loses, Pete, I don't know. You know, you're <laughs> supposed to structure your entire day multi-race wise really to get to him, I would think. You know, and, and believe me, I dug and dug to try and find something about anybody else. I mean, my best idea as an alternative was the one saint in the city, given that it's a it's a decent turf pedigree. Um, the dam was a dirt horse, but she did drop turf stakes winner a lot. Um, in Mendelssohn progeny or 18% first time out felt to me like maybe if anything, Carl Spackler could be wired. Uh, but I mean, he's just supposed to win. It is, it is a stone cold. He it's supposed to be him all the way to the hoop. No, nothing to add. I mean, just completely agree for all the obvious reasons. I will ask you this. Um, and you're good with movies. I think you'll get this. You know, do you know the reference to the name? I don't. And I knew you were going there as soon as you started saying that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is the Bill Murray character in, in Caddyshack. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> if we yep. were the kind of podcast to drop in sounds, I would do that right now. But I don't feel like going to YouTube and making an edit, you know. But anyway, it's uh, if you don't know Caddyshack, it's classic. And Carl Spackler looks uh, looks like uh, looks like the real deal for uh, E5 Thoroughbreds and Chad Brown in this spot. Uh, any closing thoughts from you, Nick, before we wrap the YouTube section of the show and uh, get to the, the second portion on the audio? No, looking forward to a fun weekend. I think this is a good sequence at Gulfstream. They'll have plenty of good racing there over the weekend. Good weather in South Florida. Excellent. Yeah, we'll add one more thing. Carl Spackler is the kind of horse that early on, if you're looking at fixed odds, they might have priced up, you know, 10 to 11, even money, even odds against. Go ahead and grab that because the horse is going to probably go off at, what, one to two? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, maybe it, shorter. This could be a something to five. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Nick, thank you very much. Um, yeah. We will see you uh, right after the break. <laughs> 